Hello everyone and thank you for coming. Welcome to the panel Professional Women Networks and Women's Leadership in Financial Inclusion at the European Microfinance Week 2021. My name is Mariana Martinez. I am the Regional Lead for Finequity ALP. I facilitate the regional dialogue for the speaking Spanish Latin American community in Finequity, a global community of practice that aims to accelerate women's economic empowerment through financial inclusion, convened by CGAP. I'm also a co-founder of Andares Mujeres Network, and I'm very excited to be here today as a speaker in this panel because this topic is very close to my heart, and I have been working on women leadership in the financial inclusion sector in Latin America and the Caribbean for a long time, and I truly feel compelled to have an impact here. I believe in the power of networking, especially for women, to connect with each other, to learn from each other's experience, grow and achieve big results. And talking about powerful women in the financial inclusion sector, we have some of them as panelists today, and they will be sharing their experience with all of us. Let me introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Barbara Magnoni, co-founder of Andares Mujeres Network. Hi, Barbara. It's so good to have you here. Hi, good morning, Mariana. Uh, we have also Marisa Pereda. She works as an associate analyst at Symbi Symbiotics in Mexico City. It's also nice to have you here, Marisa. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much. Nice to have you. We also have Laura Rosado. Laura is responsible for the strategy and performance management and impact at AXA Emerging Customers, the inclusive insurance business unit at AXA. Welcome, Laura. It's nice to have Thanks. you here. Hi, Mariana. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Really happy to be here today. And finally, but not least, we also have Chideka Nubex, and I hopefully pronouncing her last name correctly. If not, Chideka, you tell me. From the Sterling Bank in Nigeria. Welcome, and, and it's, I'm so excited to have you here. Chideka, thank you, you so much. Oh. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much, uh, Nice to be here. Fantastic. We, uh, we will start the panel by doing a short presentation so you can learn more about Finequity ALC and Andares Mujeres Network and our work in the region and how we have recently shown forces to advance the financial inclusion of women in Latin America and promote female uh, leadership. Uh, then Marisa La and Laura will share their experience on how being part of Andares Mujeres Network can be very powerful for women. Finally, we are going to reflect with Chideka and the rest of the panelists on how the Latin American experience could be re replicated in Nigeria and the rest of Africa. And at the end, we'll have a QA uh, session, so please write down your questions and comment in the chat, and don't wait until the end so we can hear from all of you. Let me share my screen to start the presentation on Finequity ALC. Uh, and please let me know if you can see it in presentation mode. Perfect. Um, for those of, that don't know uh, Finequity ALC, Finequity ALC is a new forum within Finequity Global. Uh, dedicated to promote exchange and collaborations uh, around women's financial inclusion in the Latin American and Caribbean region. And it's host uh, on the portal FinDev, CIGAP's independent knowledge management platform for financial inclusion as a space for regional dialogue in Spanish. In Spanish. Uh, we launched in January 2020 with the support from uh, external partners, initially with the Peruvian Institute of Studies, IDRC Canada and Andares Mujeres Network, and now also with CAF, the Development Bank of Latin America, BBVA, Microfinance Foundation, uh, Fundación Women's World Bank in Colombia, AFI, and Promujer. Uh, today, Finequity ALC reaches over 1,100 practitioners that represent more than 250 institutions in 21 countries in the Latin American and Caribbean region. Our members use our platform to share knowledge and experience and host discussions. And they have been very, very active uh, in the last six months. Uh, we have webinars and workshops uh, that attract between 120 to 600 participants per session. Currently, we have um, have working groups led by a fabulous uh, team of women uh, holding leadership positions in the partner institutions that I mentioned before, and then shape our learning agenda for, uh, agenda for this year. Uh, those topics are uh, public policies and financial tools for women and their, um, their families to manage the COVID-19 crisis and regain the financial health, gender intentional financial education with a focus on digital financial tools, correcting bias in the financial system by raising awareness and highlighting good providers' practices, inclusive, inclusive rural finance for women, uh, and the need for female leadership in times of COVID-19. 
a natural partner for this leadership work, uh, for this working group was Andares Network that has been working since 2015 to promote female leadership in the financial inclusion sector in Latin America and the Caribbean. But I'm going to let Barbara to explain more about Andares Mujeres, the Andares leadership study conducted in the region, as well as other activities that uh, Andares is, is doing in the region to promote uh, women's leadership. So, Barbara, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let you share yours. I, and you are on mute, Barbara. Thank you so no. much, Mariana. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I want to share with you a little bit the experience of Andares as a Latin American model, perhaps for something that can be expanded more broadly. But um, for now, just to, to share who we are. Uh, we are a network of 391 women that represent 19 countries, 17 of them in Latin America and the Caribbean. It's a Spanish speaking network. So uh, that's really the only criteria for being involved. Um, the second criteria is we have an interest in financial inclusion. And I think kind of a common uh, belief that women need to be served by financial products and services that are appropriate, responsible and helpful in their lives. Um, as such, 50% of the women in our network actually work in financial institutions in the region. And the other half work in a variety of different functions, including uh, development finance organizations, nonprofits, consultancies, and academia. Our average age is 39 years, and there's quite a range there from very young to um, some gray-haired or dye your hair like me, gray-haired women. And uh, on average, we have about 10 years experience in the field, but again, the range is quite broad from zero, very new entrance to 30 years experience. Um, one thing that's really important as we think about this, this kind of uh, demographic or this group is that um, aspirationally, it is a very ambitious group. Uh, about 13% of our members currently are directors or CEO, but 38% aspire to be there in five years. That's very ambitious. Um, similarly, and I think an important point here is that 17% of our members are consultants and 33% aspire to do that in the future. And I, I think that has a lot to do with uh, job flexibility and some of the constraints that women face in their work, um, which is something we're discussing quite a bit. Um, we have some women in academia, and I think the last bar here on the chart is also very interesting. 38% of our members are not directors or in, in uh, other kinds of roles, uh, but very few aspire to remain there, which is uh, an important uh, point. And I think, sorry, I'm going to close the door because my dog is barking. I think to this point, um, Mariana alluded to a study we did. Uh, with over 150 microfinance institutions in Latin America in 2015 with the, uh, the help of the IDB and Calmadel Foundation. And we found something um, that perhaps intuitively we knew, but it was really nice to quantify that while women are the bulk of our clients and actually half of the workforce in the microfinance sector, as we move up in the management ranks, we see that narrowing and we call it sort of this pyramid uh, shape of narrowing uh, as women go up. So we see barriers to advancement uh, as women are going up. So we have 39% uh, are senior managers, 28% are general managers, 31% uh, serve on boards um, or 31% or of boards are served by women, and only 18% are board presidents. So um, this is where we see kind of the potential barriers and constraints. And this has real implications, not just in terms of equity, but also um, in terms of the scope and outreach of our financial institutions that we're working for. Um, and, and how they serve women in particular. We know that some of the institutions that do serve women tend to be smaller, they might be uh, less likely to be regulated. Well, interestingly, um, on average, uh, institutions served by women tend to be smaller and less regulated. Um, therefore, they are reaching, you know, the, sort of the female population in Latin America that we want to reach. Um, another thing that we know is that women tend to hire and inspire women. And 54% um, of um, the upper management of organizations are women when a woman is a general manager. When a man is a general manager, only 33% of those roles are held by women. So we really see this impact of bringing women up and women bringing women up 
with them, which is such an important part of, um, you know, sort of promoting women's leadership within institutions. So as on that is, as a network, what do we do? How do we kind of contribute to this? Um, we have identified kind of three areas where we um, contribute primarily uh, with some uh, maybe bleeding into other topics, but, uh, and these areas were identified by surveying our members and really trying to understand what they thought was important. The first is learning. Uh, we learn and we develop professionally, and that's really the, the main um, path to leadership, and it's a really important path. And often women are excluded from certain learning opportunities, um, like big conferences, et cetera. Similarly, networking, which is something available at big conferences, et cetera, but also in smaller groups, um, tends to be a space where women might be excluded because they're busy uh, after work, they're rushing to uh, take care of family responsibilities, they don't have time to go out and uh, have a drink or, or um, kind of chat uh, informally, which is where so much business and learning takes place. And then finally, mentorship, where women who have already followed certain paths can kind of um, give examples and, and pull women up. Um, more specifically, just to give a flavor of the work that we do, we have uh, a number of regional online events, some in partnership with Finequity, as Mariana mentioned, uh, and others that are kind of our uh, own uh, homegrown events. Uh, some are just meet and greet, get to know each other activities. Uh, and then we've covered topics that vary from very technical topics in financial inclusion to sort of softer skills uh, and leadership topics. So I'll give you some examples from this list. Like right now we're tackling the issue of how do we retain female staff during COVID when so many women are leaving the workforce. Um, we've looked at topics around insurance and remittances, uh, reactivating businesses um, post COVID and also sort of strategies for women in networking, um, et cetera. We've also um, been developing national networks that have more in-person kind of face-to-face -face activities. Obviously with COVID, this has been dampened a bit. Um, both Laura and Maritza who are here with you today have participated, so I'll let them explain it a little bit more. Um, and here we also look at sort of the soft skills, but, uh, but some of the technical issues that might be important uh, in a market. For example, women in FinTech is something we've explored quite a bit in um, collaboration with Finovista in Mexico client segmentation, retaining clients, but also things like how do you work with a multi-generational um, staff or management uh, as women and how do we collaborate multi-generationally, which is something that sometimes gets forgotten. We also have a blog site, which we welcome uh, you to check out and see some of our uh, publications. Many refer to these events um, and provide a lot of networking activities, not always face-to-face, -face, not always during these like scheduled times because we know women's time is constrained, but also through social media, through WhatsApp and sort of more informal activities that everybody has access to and can participate in. Um, we've also, um, uh, conducted a few programs that are um, learning and growth opportunities for uh, particularly some of the younger women that are in the network. Uh, one uh, institutional exchange program, there's a photo here of, of one of the women who's selected to go visit another MFI and spend some time there and learn about their savings program, as well as scholarship competitions, uh, which Maritza, who's here with us today, participated in and can share a little bit more about. These are just some photos from um, the Finovista event in Mexico. So I want to just kind of wrap up uh, to, to share with you sort of what's different about us or unique about our approach and how we do things. And the first thing that I think is very unique is that we're grassroots and bottom up. And what that means is we're not being told what to do. There's no uh, development agenda to support our organization. We really listen to our members and say, hey, what do you need? Do we need to advocate for something in your market? Do we need to publish something about a specific topic? Do you want us to bring speakers from other experiences and markets to share their experience? experiences with your uh, country? Do you want to have conversations? And that's really how we set our agenda and our strategy. And as I mentioned, we use sort of the appropriate media to do that so that it's flexible and caters to difficult schedules um, and time. Um, we really seek to find a, a common ground and be as inclusive as possible. And what that means is we have a very diverse uh, group of women from various backgrounds, ages, uh, and experiences. And, and as such, we don't really push a specific ideology. We're really kind of just finding what it is we have in common and what we care about together 
um, that we can work on together and leave the other stuff kind of out of the way. Um, and that really, what, what that results in is what I think is one of the most beautiful things and hopefully from the photographs you've seen that yourself is this community of learning, but also of caring. We care about each other. We wanna support each other. You might have women from competing organizations in a market, you know, sharing experiences in this really collaborative, positive way. And it's such a special thing to participate in uh, and be a part of in, in a world that is otherwise incredibly uh, exclusionary and competitive. Um, I just put a little example of some of our chats on WhatsApp and, and the, the sharing that takes place there. And for us, sharing is, we always call it our whiskey. In Latin America, it's very common for men to go out for whiskey on Friday after work or uh, during a conference after a conference. And, you know, a lot of um, actually technical knowledge and technical sharing gets shared through those, those moments. Uh, but we may not always have time to participate. We may not want to drink whiskey. We may uh, want a different kind of space that's more comfortable and uh, inclusive to us. And so on that is really looks uh, to present, you know, that opportunity for the women in our network. Uh, and often we say on that is, is our whiskey. Um, and that's who we are. Uh, this is a, a comment that we, we've been gathering some impressions from some of our members and you'll hear Laura and Maritza a little bit more. Uh, but this is a comment that I thought was very nice and sort of descriptive of who we are and what we do. And that is, is a community where we exchange knowledge and experiences. It's like a family a space that motivates us where we strengthen microfinance with a comprehensive development approach. And I think that really is what uh, sets us apart and makes us uh, both kind of uh, committed to being together, but also committed to uh, furthering the development of our uh, financial inclusion space and ensuring that women are included and served uh, well and responsibly. So I uh, will kind of stop uh, chatting about Andares in this kind of abstract form and actually hand it over to um, Maritza to share a little bit about her experience and then Laura as well. Great. Thank you very much, Barbara. First, I would like to thank Andares for being part of this panel of such inspiring women. Uh, my name is Maritza Pereda. I'm Peruvian. I currently work in Mexico City, and I work as an associate analyst in Symbiotics, which is one of the leading asset managers focused on impact investing. Today, I can talk to you about the different financial indicators that we use to monitor our portfolio. But a couple of years ago, I knew little about the impact of microfinance. Even though I grew up and worked with my father when I was 12 years old in this environment, uh, we were surrounded by people who were from Monday to Sunday, including holidays, with the purpose to provide a better quality life to their family and also provide education to them. Once I started working in the sector, I realized that microfinance is related to my life and it gave me more motivation to keep working, to keep training me and to give the best of me because I knew by first hand the impact of a micro loan can create in that people's life and also the things that could be provided by the microfinance institutions to help their clients to achieve their goals. When I went to my first meeting in Andares, I felt inspired. Because when I started in the sector, we were only two women in my team. And also I received some discouraging comments about being part of the financial sector. But seeing such a large group of women uh, who are managing different financial institutions and also are part of the microfinance world, it motivated me to keep training and to go further with my career. In this sense, I would like to thank Andares for giving me the opportunity to deepen in my knowledge in microfinance, and also for the scholarship they offered me with the Boulder Institute of Microfinance, where I had the chance to learn with my colleagues from more than 19 countries, and also from the best practices of recognized professionals who come from rating agencies, DFIs, among others. Furthermore, I would like to highlight that in order to generate a change, it's important that everyone be involved. From the investor side, we monitor how many loans we provide to women, and also we recently uh, launched uh, some sustainable bonds, mainly in the case of social bonds, we try to promote more loans for women as an additional tool. Now, returning to my point that everyone should be involved, 
I asked our HR manager what symbiotics is doing in order to support the persons of women in management positions, because currently there are very few. <laughs> and I am glad to mention that the company is already working towards this. They hired a consultant uh, to identify important improvement points to have more diverse and inclusive environment because we all come from more than 20 countries in the whole company. Finally, I would like to mention that having networks and diaries, the participation of such panels like this, as well of the inclusion of more women in the panelist list, because there are a few in the, in, the, in the most conference that we can see online. Also talking to your manager about the, what the company actions are taking in place or how to place women in leadership positions are necessary actions in order to generate a change in the company structure. Thank you. So wonderful. Thank you so much, Marita. And I'm so glad that you're taking this to the next level within your institution. <laughs> Yes. Well, I think it's important to, to talk about it and to participate everyone in this conversation. Great. Laura, do you want to share a few thoughts as well? Yeah, absolutely, Barbara. And, and thank you, Marita, because it's a, it's a very inspiring story. Uh, the, the point I want to share here today is more also the, 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 the business motivation of, of why having more women at the top, right? And, and I, I think I, I'd start probably by, by restating the obvious. And I don't know how many in this audience have read the book, Invisible Women by Caroline Criado Perez. Um, if you haven't, it's really eye-opening. And I think anyone wanting to better serve women needs to read this book. Um, because among many other insights, the book highlights that there is no such thing as a neutral product, be it trans the design of transportation routes, smartphone design, building temperatures, drug dosage, and certainly financial uh, products are not the exception. If decision makers of anything are mostly men, there will be an implicit bias embedded in the design, in the servicing, and the marketing, and in performance tracking of your products. Therefore, as, as, I, said, as I said it initially, whomever wants to better serve women needs to first start by having more women in decision-making role. So um, just, you know, just, just giving that first big picture. And then moving straight into, into Andares and the motivations and, and my experience, I see four critical things where, 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 where Andares has really made a difference. The, the first thing is it, it creates uh, uh, an environment for having women discussing and co-creating about our common goal, which is improving the financial health of low-income and mass market women. Um, and I, I have seen this all along the COVID crisis where Andaris members uh, were continuously sharing their, you know, direct from the field information regarding uh, the situation of their women clients, their ability to cope with repayment of loans, the, the strategies being put in place to kind of support and accompany uh, women clients all along the way. And I just found that to be really inspiring and also very professional because that's really the driver of also the women that are part of this uh, of this network. The second thing it was the creation of a safe space where women can talk about their quest to lead because as Barbara was saying, the aspiration is there. Um, and then the question mark is how do we accompany each other to, to make it there? Um, and and, and it's, it's a safe space to share challenges faced uh, within the organizations, within the industry in general, um, with the idea of coming up you know, with, with tools, testimonies to continue that path um, to leadership. I, I saw this on, on, that, on, on one of the sessions in Mexico City, uh, obviously before COVID, where I had the opportunity to exchange uh, on one hand with women at the top of leading MFIs, kind of sharing their path, their, their challenges and their journey. Uh, and it gave me the opportunity to also share my path, my experience with more recently graduated women working uh, in, the, in the financial inclusion space. I, I felt that highly energizing and kind of uh, giving me the sense of, of uh, sorority, if, if I can call it like that. Um, the third one is opening opportunities to discuss role models, right? Because representation matters a lot when trying to build a career and, and trying to make it to the top. And I think that the, the figures shared by Barbara earlier uh, kind of reinforce 
that comment, representation matters, role models matter, and uh, having in Andares the possibility to see uh, these role models, exchanging with them, uh, it, it's kind of a, a, a critical source of, of inspiration. And then finally, the role on, on promoting thought leadership, which is, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the topic of, of women leadership in the financial inclusion space is something that perhaps we are not talking about enough. Um, and, and I think that a, a clear example of it is some members within the network already sharing uh, how their organizations are taking some of the lessons um, and the study and the research done by Andares to influence their investment policy decisions for, you know, funding microfinance or their HR decisions for uh, fostering a more inclusive uh, workplace, as, as Maristel was also highlighting. And then finally, I'll, I'll, I'll just close with saying that I, I think Andares has uh, has a proposition for women that, that should be replicated uh, at a regional level. And I know that we would discuss this with, with uh, GDECA today, but, but, but I think it should be also replicated across sectors in the inclusive insurance space. And, uh, you know, where in, in, in the inclusive insurance space, we, we, we might want to replicate this because it's as important as, as it is a case for, for microfinance or asset managers, et cetera. Thank you, Laura and Marisa, for sharing those powers of stories. And I hope that it have inspired the colleagues in the audience to show this kind of ne networks and why not to replicate in other regions, as La Laura just uh, said. Um, and for that, um, it's why I listened after listening to Laura and Marisa and, and Laura uh, and the Andares Leadership Study in Latin America and the Caribbean, I, Caribbean, I would like to ask Jideka. First, to introduce herself and speak of her experience in the banking sector in Nigeria as a woman. And more specifically, it would be great if you can talk about if there are, there are enough uh, women in senior management positions and how might this impact the way the bank offers financial services to women there. Sideka? All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, so good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are actually taking the call from. So my name is Injideka Nwambweze, and I am currently the group head of education at Sterling Bank in Nigeria. Um, Sterling Bank is a financial service provider committed to enriching lives through convenient financial services. Um, and there, I'm responsible for driving the education sector strategy with a focus on providing access to finance, to low income schools and supporting these schools improve the quality of education. Now, proud to this, um, I've worked at Access Bank PLC in Nigeria, also where I manage a women led digital saving solution for low income entrepreneurs. And this solution basically encourages savings, investment, and provide access to micro lending opportunities to help support and grow their businesses. Now, um, I've had say more than 15 years banking experience in the, I mean, in the, in, the, in, the, in the commercial banking and retail banking space in Nigeria. So basically in all, I would say that I have, I think I have more than 15 years um, banking experience in the banking industry. And we know that um, the banking sector worldwide generally is a male dominated industry. But today I can tell you that the Nigerian banking sector is currently seeing a surge in the number of women at its top management and at the board level. So um, in Nigeria, we presently have eight women who are currently occupying the positions of chief executive officers out of the 23 banks we have in Nigeria. And these statistics basically signify that we have started the journey and a new era of women leadership in the financial sector. So, um, you would agree with me that um, even though we are not doing so much right now, we're doing 35% representation at the top um, echelon of the bank, but um, the stipulated board, um, the stipulated target that the CBN gave to us was about 40. So I would vividly say that we are getting there. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. Um, this year alone was very remarkable because we had about, I think, two um, female CEOs become, you know, um, CEOs in their various banks. And we look forward to 2022 because I'm sure that we're going to see more of these roles play out in favor of women. Now, also, I'm talking about my, last, my past experience in my previous role as the head of digital financial services for women. 
um, I want to say that when we deployed our agency banking, we actually employed more women, you know, as sales agents. And we actually see remarkable results. You know, the results coming from the women were actually phenomenal compared to the male counterparts. And I can see that in the formal um, sector, there are more, I mean, more people are employing women into their, you know, ecosystem because, you know, it's really, I mean, it's, 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 it's all, it's, it's a great business case to say that, you know, when you really empower women, you're actually empowering the whole world. So I want to believe that the surge in the number of women taking up top positions in the banking industry will bring focus in investing with more women, investing in more women and also accelerating the initiatives of banks, developing more financial services tailored to address the needs of women and women financial inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Sideka. And so do you, do you, what I'm hearing from you is that you really believe that uh, having women's leaders are uh, in, in top leadership positions and needed to make, that, uh, to make sure that women's clients are well served by the financial institutions. And in, in this context, and after you listen, uh, hear what Barbara, and Laura and Melissa said, um, do you feel that it would be a value in having a version of Amdaris in Nigeria or Africa? And if so, if you can, um, let us know how it might be different uh, for the current way that we are, that we are, we are structuring uh, and that is, uh, for example, if you envision something that it will be, it will be a network that will be only be composed by financial institutions specifically or more generally, gener generically uh, business oriented. What do you think, uh, Chideka? Okay, so thank you very much, um, Martina, right? Mariana. Mariana, thank you very much. I think, I think to answer that your question, basically, it's, it will be important for me to actually share the value of the women network. So for me, I think I believe that there's a power in the value of network, especially in fostering um, women leadership in financial inclusion. So like we all know, men are generally more aggressive about networking and they get into conversations very quickly than women. Um, so there's a research that says that um, women tend to seek emotional and social support from their networks, whereas men tend to seek an exchange of direct benefits, such as you know, promotion opportunities, job openings, and business opportunities as well. So you can imagine when men go out um, and they network, you know, they're talking business, they're talking transactions, they're talking um, how to you know, enrich themselves, how to grow their businesses and all of that. Um, so, I, I mean, I like giving this example, like my family and I are members of one of the prestigious clubs in Lagos, Nigeria, and we go there every weekend, you know, to, you know, spend some time and all of that. And one of the games that they play there is golf, right? So anytime we go to, to, um, to I mean, to the club, all the men, all the, you know, you'll see only men, right, playing golf. And I keep asking myself, why are there not women involved in these high power sports that can boost their networking capabilities? So I think women need to show up more. Sorry, one second, please. So I think, I think women need to show up more and the women networking groups are great opportunities to help provide that support mechanism for women to share their stories and also get help in areas they need to get better and improve in their careers. Um, one of the women um, network groups that we have in Nigeria is the WIMBIS. And the meaning of WIMBIS is Women in Management, Business and Public Service. It's a nonprofit organization and its, ob and its objective is just similar to what we just heard about, the Andres. And basically they're there to promote women's leadership in business and management, as well as support and empower women. Um, they implement programs that inspire, empower and advocate you know, for greater representation of women in the leadership positions. So they have various programs for women, including you know, mentoring, coaching sessions for upcoming women leaders, you know, um, um, round tables, events where they talk about women and money, for example, building personal brand for women who are board um, ready. And they also have mentoring sessions with top board members. And they teach them about corporate governance and all of that. So, we have more of those kinds of networks in Nigeria, and I believe they will be ready to change the status quo of ensuring that the increased number of women participation in um, leadership in, I mean, in, in, in leadership. So to answer your question directly, I believe that the Andres Women Network Program is a great fellowship, and I find the learning exchanges very, very expiring, especially, I mean, 
um, one of, I mean, we have um, and someone who had benefited from this program and who came to share our testimonies, right? And one of the things that I actually really, really love that I think is missing in our own fellowship is that, you know, learning exchanges, exchanges of staff, you know, um, um, you know, to go learn what, you know, each this institution is doing or that institution is doing, and also the, 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 the scholarship um, and opportunities as well. So um, I've been a beneficiary of the WIMB scholarship program, um, where I was sponsored on an all expense paid trip to a two day um, UN Women European private you know, sector training on gender tools, concepts and principles. So this model really worked in Nigeria, but I still believe that we need to focus, um, have a focus network group for women leadership in financial inclusion that will really focus on serving women responsibly and equitably through our various finance, financial institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Sideka. After hearing from you that women need to show up more and network more and get out there in, in Nigeria, I wonder if Marisa, maybe you can share some personal experience or thoughts uh, that of what might encourage women in Nigeria or even in the other regions, since we have uh, uh, other colleagues in the audience, uh, to join a network such as uh, as Andaria. and also make this link with what is missing in the in the networks that Jideka um, uh, has mentioned that are currently available in in Nigeria. Sure. Um, actually, uh, when I I started in the sector, I was trying to find places where I could also share my experiences and talk about more about the microfinance sector. But I've more, I found more organizations focused only on women in finance. And far more than that, I couldn't find it. But when a colleague told me, hey, you should join Andares, and I told him, why well, I never heard about it <laughs> before? And uh, he started talking to me like, well, this is a network of women that supports each other. And it, it's correct because when I went to this meeting, I saw women who were leading microfinance institutions who are actually competitors. <laughs> and they were still there sharing their experiences, how they were doing some changes inside the company. And they people around us, uh, they asked how they do it. And she had like the most gentle way of telling everyone like, well, we did this because we consider that this should be improved. Also, we share some studies that through the WhatsApp group that during this time of the pandemic and also the opportunity of having a scholarship. I think these are the kind of spaces that we need to feel closer to us and we can talk freely and be understood about what we are talking about because at the end we want to support the base of the pyramid. We want to create a change. And also it should be starting from us by helping each other to be more participating in this kind of spaces. Laura, based on your experience with Andares, and um, since you are in, in like in the well, you are in the insurance uh, sector, which is not particularly we, we focus Andares focus more on the broad uh, financial inclusion sector. Do you need that there is a, a need uh, to create a whole network of women in the insurance sector, or will it be enough to collaborate with network, networks such as Andares that are already established and are more broad? Since after all, I think we, our common goal is to make sure that low-income uh, women are not left out of the financial inclusion equation. Yeah, great question, Mariana, and I think at least for inclusive insurance, so kind of the, the equivalent of, of microfinance, uh, but, but from the insurance sector side, I, I think there's definitely a need uh, for, for, for women wanting to grow in, in the inclusive insurance space to, to just gather along. I don't think there is a need to just discuss insurance because as you were saying, you know, what we share between inclusive insurance and microfinance is the, the, the end objective of improving the financial health and well-being of low-income and mass market women. Uh, and, and I actually think that there are cross-sectorial opportunities even to improve our products and improve what, what, how we better serve women. So, uh, I mean, I, in, in, in my dreams, I would want to see more women in the inclusive insurance space, perhaps being part of the Andares community, uh, kind of giving more visibility to Andares within the inclusive insurance space. 
uh, because I think that the, 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 the richness of the platform is there, the, 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 the lessons, the approach are there. And I think it would be, it would be a pity to, to, to think that we would need to start from scratch uh, in, on the inclusive insurance side. But obviously it's my, my very personal opinion and uh, it's a, kind of a more diverse, um, a more diverse space. Well, I'll, I might want to add something to that because we, we've had a couple of sessions on insurance um, and then that is, and I think one was in Peru, I don't know if you attended, but uh, there's enormous interest in this topic because it is um, offered by so many financial institutions reaching the bottom of the pyramid and, you know, with, with some great success in some cases and, and mixed success in others. And so there's a real hunger to understand and learn from there. Um, and I think often insurers um, make certain assumptions about um, microfinance institutions or banks or cooperatives, I see them as kind of generic distribution channels without really understanding often the motivations and, um, and kind of uh, business models that they work within. So I, I think it is very enriching to combine uh, different product and service providers that serve the same market. And I think some of the challenges might be similar in terms of the representation of women on, you know, on, on leadership positions as well. Thank you, Laura. I would I would like to remind our colleagues in the audience that they can make questions um, in the chat. Uh, I'm sure that I can see that uh, in this in this chat that I'm seeing. So I, I really don't know if we do have questions. Uh, if uh, I don't know if Barbara can check or any of you because I. I don't, I don't see that, but if not, um, I would like to invite Barbara maybe um, to make the connection or remind all of that, that uh, our final goal is, is, the, is, is, the, is, the, is the low income client, right? How we don't uh, lose that vision uh, while we are trying to, uh, or how do we connect that with the leadership of women in the, in the sector? Thanks, Mariana. And Laura alluded to this a little bit when she was talking about representation and data. and. I think one of the things, and, and this is not to discount the interest of male colleagues in supporting women clients, um, but we, we do uh, tend to have a little bit more of an empathy and understanding of issues surrounding women um, that might make us more aware at least of the potential for bias in our products and services or the potential for needing to uh, customize or tailor um, certain marketing approaches, certain uh, com compensation strategies in order to better serve women. Um, so if we think about, I, I, I would love to use the example of Peru, unfortunately, in, in a bad way. Uh, what happened when Peru's uh, microfinance boom took place is we actually saw less and less lending to women in the sector because the motivations and incentives were to grow loan portfolios, to uh, grow fast, and uh, to increase uh, average loan sizes, which we saw in Peru. Uh, but what we saw happen alongside that is actually a reduction in lending to women because women tended to be the people who needed smaller loans um, and maybe couldn't afford the larger loans or it would be almost irresponsible to, to serve them. Now that's kind of made a turn back uh, around since. Um, but certainly sort of having that sensitivity to what's happening to our female clients is so important when we think about financial inclusion and the vulnerability of uh, women who manage households, many of them alone, um, and how we want to make sure that that sort of essence of, of what we're doing um, does focus on women. And how do you do that without having um, women in the helm? And I'll say a second thing that came out through our study which I think is also very important, which is if institutionally my mission says I want to help low-income communities and households, and if I say I want to help women and I believe in women and they're going to be wonderful loan clients and I'm going to treat them professionally and they're going to pay back their loans because they're responsible and all these wonderful things, I am telling my women clients I believe in them. When they come to my office and they don't see women leading, they might question whether I actually believe in them or if I'm just using them as vehicles. Because if you believe in women, you hire women, you promote women, you retain women, uh, you show that your institution believes in women internally, or we say at home, you know, beginning at home, in order for that culture and that 
uh, vision to be communicated to your customers. If your customers are only hearing that you care about them, but they're not seeing that you believe in them, they will doubt whether you actually believe in them. And you've seen some really interesting models um, that do focus on promoting women, that do focus on um, you know, working with female staff. Uh, we used a couple of case studies, including Banco Pichincha in our paper, um, where you see the impact also on client retention and client satisfaction and client service because of that alignment. So uh, those are all things that we believe in really strongly and, and that kind of support the need for this uh, network. I know there are a couple of questions coming in, so I'll, I'll also leave room for that. Well, yes, we have one question that's coming from Bob Summers. Uh, he's asking if Inequity have regional chapters in places other than LAC, and I have to say to you, Bob, that uh, not yet. Um, uh, Finiquity LC is, is, has been launched like a pilot that will be a role model for other regions, and we hope to have them in Asia and Africa in the in the future. We do have, of course, the global uh, Finiquity, which uh, aims to the whole um, world. And uh, perhaps. Uh, uh, Having one um, making the connection with the, what Barbara uh, was saying about um, the, the invisible, invisible women, or so the need of uh, not only say that we support women, but we, we actually do that. Perhaps we want to talk. We can we'll talk a little more about uh, why we did our webinar uh, with Finequity ALC um, about the uh, how uh, how to retain female, female ta uh, talents in times of COVID because we have seen that um, it has been the case that. Uh, women have been more affected that, um, than than men in the in the labor force, and uh, we, we are working on on uh, on having some institutions um, showing the uh, how the lead and how they are doing to to retain this female talent. And I don't know if, if Barbara would like you would like to to yeah. comment on that. And yeah, I think it's an incredible um, kind of example of this concept of uh, designing for extremes that that has come up quite a bit in the context of serving women, where not that women are extremes, but um, where sometimes we think about a problem with a lens that in this case is a female lens. So we're saying, you know, women, because of a multitude of reasons, are um, harder to retain in the microfinance sector today um, during the pandemic. And that has to do with online school and all the family responsibilities that they end up having to um, take on in addition to their work, uh, which also makes their mobility a little bit more challenged, um, their time more challenged. Uh, it has to do with compensation and the fact that their time is actually worth less now because uh, it's very difficult to meet certain uh, loan targets. So you might not be receiving very large commissions right now. So I'm earning less. I have you know, less interest in this job because I'm being torn in many ways. And so there is um, in some institutions and in some countries, we are seeing this kind of greater migration of women, which is reflective of what we're seeing worldwide, right? The, the great resignation and the fact that uh, many women are leaving the workforce, unfortunately, after so many years of gain um, that we've achieved. And so in Andaris, we're, we're tackling this uh, by inviting women in MFIs that have either avoided this preemptively or who are addressing this with very specific uh, policy responses. And what's so interesting to me is that, um, you know, the, the result of addressing this issue is going to benefit male and female employees, as well as um, kind of the institution and the sector overall, because uh, I don't know, Maritza, were you ever a loan officer? Probably not, but it is not an easy job. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a very challenging, demanding job that requires a lot of hours, you know, outdoors on your feet, on motorcycles and, and different vehicles, um, and has not always maybe um, complied with certain international labor standards that we would assume uh, are fair. 
And that has always been uh, overlooked in the sector. And suddenly, in light of the great resignation, in light of this departure of women, some institutions are starting to say, well, maybe we need to you know, be a little bit more flexible with our hours. Uh, maybe we need to have certain policies for people who are going through difficult times uh, that want to work from home for a period of time so that to allow them for that. Um, maybe we need to think about compensation differently. And those are all things that could have been done 10 years ago and would have been good for the sector probably 10 years ago for men and women in the sector, but that are only coming out now as we start to see this uh, problem emerge. So, um, you know, by, by thinking about a, a female problem, which is an important one and we think is very important because imagine if we had that 53% at the bottom, you know, if, if some of those leave and that triangle narrows even more, we'll have fewer opportunities for women to learn and grow uh, and rise in their institution. So this is a woman problem, but it's a problem that actually affects all of the staff of institutions and that by, um, coming up with solutions that are tailored to women, we might also be supporting men, performance, staff retention in general, which is very important. I don't know, Maritza, you keep saying yes, so I would love to hear if you agree or what your thoughts are on that. Yes, I mean, when we have also the due diligence with our clients, we can see that the loan officers, particularly for the, in, in the areas that are far located, they want to push forward the, the presence of women on, on this field, because when you have female uh, loan officers and also you have your female clients, they can feel that they are closer and they can understand. And also they are more open to say, what do you need in order to improve uh, your situation? And also if when we go there and to visit our clients and see that we are women also, because hopefully and in my company, we are 50-50, so it's equal. And they say, so you all can also grow up in your company. I say like, yes. And she feels motivated that it could also change that for their family because most of the people who come from uh, low income houses, they say, well, we want to improve the education of our kids. We want to give them a better future. And to see that there are women who are also growing up in their career uh, inspired me that my girl or my kid can also become like that. And I think that, yes, it's important to also have these open conversations and to mention that it's possible, but we also need to support each other in this long term. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, it, it's sort of funny because the inspiration for them, that is, was sort of started from a very similar experience where, um, you know, I, I, I started to kind of informally mentor one person and another person. And, and then I was like, I can't, I can't have a hundred people following me around. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is too much for me personally. This needs to be institutionalized. This needs to be something that we uh, do jointly and uh, work together on. And, and, you know, that was certainly like one of the, the reasons that I was like, let's, let's make this bigger. <laughs> I don't know, Mariana, if you agree with that or, Yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's the why we co-founded and that is, I believe that is our goal and our vision and what we are meant to do. Um, I'm so happy to be part of the of the of the of the net of the network. And after hearing all of you, um, I was wondering maybe uh, asking uh, Hideka about um, uh, uh, if if she sees this uh, need to retain female. Uh, 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 women, female talents in the in this in the financial inclusion sector or in the financial sector uh, in Nigeria or uh, and in the rest of Africa. Just think we're exchanging ideas from different regions. Sorry, um, Mariana, I didn't get that question right. Oh yes, I was I was saying if you see uh, you see this need to retain female uh, um, uh, talents in 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 the Nigeria oh. in Nigeria and, and Africa as we see it right now in Latin America. Oh yes, absolutely. Um, I think I mentioned that when I when I gave when I spoke about you know the value of women network and also I mean the value of um, inclusive women women in you know. Um, the various, you know, businesses and associations and networks that we build. So I give an example of the, you know, the value proposition that I drove in the bank. And um, 
So when we're doing the selection in terms of, you know, the uh, mobile agents that we'll be using, um, we had, you know, we, 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 it was, we made an intention to recruit more female, right? And we saw the clear results, you know, women are more, um, they felt more, they were more passionate, they were more, you know, they show more empathy, you know, to customers and, 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 and so the result was, was very clear, you know, the female um, um, agents were doing much more better than the male agents. So I think, I think we can't over, overemphasize the, you know, the value that women bring to the table. When you hand them over anything that they do, they throw in their passion and they try and, you know, make sure that they, they do it well. I mean, we've, we've, we know that, I mean, most men think that women are weak, but, you know, now it's, it's, it's the awareness is getting to, you know, to women. And, you know, I'm excited and happy that we're actually coming out, you know, and really facing this challenge. And a lot of women in the banking sector and even in where I work right now are really doing very well. Um, and uh, I mean, in, in terms of, um, women leadership, even in the organization where I work now, I think that we were also doing very well. And there's that focus, that's intentional um, drive to ensure that, you know, we continue to mentor, coach women to even do much more and surpass, you know, the expectations of, of men. Yeah. Thank you, Sileka. I see Barbara's nodding, so do you wanna add yeah. something? And, and I wanted to ask um, Maritza, um, after the, you know, the training that she, she had in the Boulder Institute, was, were there any knowledge sharing session with, you know, probably other women in the, in the bank just to also, you know, um, inspire them basically and for them to look forward to getting their own scholarship and, you know, going to also, you know, learn what you learn, what you learned. Yes, actually, had the opportunity. Well, I'm going to share it with my colleagues here, and also I would like to share it with Andares and the lessons learned and during these weeks that were the problem, because we had a vision from the rating agencies, we have the vision from the World Bank, and also from the microfinance institutions. What we should do about to improve the and continue with the microfinance sector because it's developing, it has more than 20 years, what is the future about it, what we can do. Um, it was mentioned also that need of digitals, uh, many processes are uh, in the company and also to support our clients who were mainly affected by the crisis. Oh, I can share happily with you more of the information that we learned during these weeks. Thanks. Thank you, Marisa and Sideka. Well done, thank you. Yes, we have a, a question in the chat and we would we'll, we'll like to make sure to, that we answer in the three minutes that we have left. Uh, let me see if I can read it. Um, I can read it if I can scroll down. Um, it says, when talking about the future of financial inclusion, I guess, um, the financial inclusion industry, we find two key factors. First, generation, generational change and two, the use of new technologies. My question, the question from the audience is, do you find any opportunities on those factors in order to promote, let me see, I imagine it's the financial gender equality in the industry? Yeah, so I have, I have a comment on this and I, I want to always, you know, we always think technology is going to help women. I always think it's the opposite. Technology can hurt women. So we have to be very careful about how we apply it and use it and what it means. Um, uh, I'll start with the generational issue though, because I, I work with a lot of young people, both in my company and I teach and young people have very different expectations of what work means. And while they are seeking purpose, men and women, um, they're also seeking work-life balance and microfinance has historically been a a field at every level that has no work-life balance. Um, in uh, developing markets, maybe women are able to, you know, contract out some housework a little bit more cost-effectively and, and balance it a little bit more. Uh, but as we move into younger generations, unless the sector changes the way that it operates, uh, I do not think that this will be a positive uh, net for women or for quality talent retention. Um, and so th there needs to be an intentional effort. On the technology piece, um, while technology in theory uh, is more inclusive or can be more inclusive, um, and I think there's some great advantages in terms of collecting data, making products more customized. Uh, Laura talked a lot about the value of data here. Um, 
you know, if we think about technology jobs being higher earning jobs, higher potential jobs, women are even more excluded from those jobs than they are from uh, financial sector jobs. And so to the extent that uh, financial institutions become much more technological, we may actually see less uh, participation of women unless we make a very intentional effort uh, to draw them in. We saw this uh, in financial institutions and in microfinance uh, as we became more sophisticated around risk management. We were trying to bring in new risk management people. It was very difficult to find women with experience in risk management. Um, we will find the same challenges in technology. And so we have to be incredibly intentional and purposeful uh, as we bring in technologies to make sure that they are inclusive, uh, both for staff and for final uh, users. Thank you, Barbara. Laura, I think you were you were trying to make a comment. If not, I continue. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I just wanted maybe to reinforce, to simply say that they are conducive factors, uh, maybe indeed opportunities, but if there is no in, like for intentionality, as Barbara was highlighting, we might miss these opportunities and we might not turn them into accelerators. Thank you, Laura. We are at the end of the, the time that we have for the panel. So I hope this conversation has inspired you to join a women's network and see the powerful value they have on women. Uh, we invite you to join and that is Mujeres Network and Finequity ALC Community of Practice and think on the possibility of replicating this kind of network in your region. So thank you very much our to our panelists and to our audience.